Hello everyone and welcome to Take Your Essays to the Next Level with Ursula Hackett. Uh, my name is Jenny and I'm a university partner with the JS Group. Um, we'd like to thank Ursula and Macmillan for helping us to arrange this session free of charge. I'm very excited to welcome Ursula for this event. There are some really, really good tip, hints and tips coming up. So um, to make sure that you don't miss any of them, we are recording the event and we'll be sending a link out to all attendees after the event. So don't worry if you think you've missed something, we will be sharing that with you afterwards. And um, I'm very pleased to welcome my colleague, Rosie from Macmillan. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for tuning in and joining us today. Um, I hope you can all hear Jenny and I. Um, if you're having any issues with the sound, then please do uh, pop a message to us in the chat or in the questions so that we're aware of any issues um, with the audio. Um, as Jenny said, I'm Rosie and I'm the Associate Commissioning Editor for Study Skills at Midland International Higher Education. And it's a pleasure to be working with JS Group on this series of webinars. And I'm delighted to introduce you today to Dr. Ursula Hackett from Royal Holloway University of London, um, where she's a senior lecturer in politics. Um, you have the ability to write brilliant essays, and I hope that the examples and activities that Ursula is going to talk you through um, today will give you the tools and confidence um, to take your essays to the next level whenever you next have to write one. Uh, we'll have some time at the end of today's webinar for questions, so if you've got any comments, any feedback on the event or questions you'd like to put to Ursula at the end, then please put them in the questions box to the right of your screen and we'll get through as many as we can um, at the end. Um, as Jenny said, we'll be recording today's webinar, so if for any reason you have to drop off or you've got a friend who missed it because they've got something else on, um, then there'll be a recording shared after the event. Over to you, Ursula. Great, thank you ever so much, Rosie. I'm going to share my screen at this point. Okay, um, I hope that we can all see my slides here. Um, thank you ever so much. I am delighted to be able to talk to you today about some practical techniques that you can use to take your essays to the next level. Um, this webinar is going to be for ambitious students who want to move on from average grades, middling marks, and create brilliant, original, high-scoring essays that are hopefully enjoyable both for you to write and for your tutors to read. The problem uh, I think students often face when they get to university essay writing is that it can seem quite hard to crack the code. Um, sometimes it seems as if you can write something that's very well structured. It's got four middle paragraphs, um, debate, conclusion. Uh, it's got good spelling and grammar, full of impressive sounding quotations, following rules that you might have learned at school. But at university, following prescriptive rules about how an essay should go can often trap you in the sort of vanilla middle grades. You don't crash and burn but you're unlikely to be able to really reach up to the top grades. So how do you get from a 2-1 to a first? How do you write something that is original, sophisticated and authoritative? Um, well, the answer uh, that I'm going to be emphasising throughout this webinar is that there is no single formula. There's no special formula for writing brilliant essays. There are multiple pathways to good work. Um, there's no single right way to create an essay. The key is to think independently about the question at hand. Uh, now, there are certain practical techniques that you can utilise to think more creatively around the question, to loosen up, think about it independently. And we'll discuss some of those today during the webinar. Now, I think everyone can improve. I'm not going to guarantee you first. Um, but you'd be surprised how much you can do with the tools of everyday language that you already possess. Have confidence. You are in the driving seat. So this is going to be an interactive webinar. I'm very much looking forward to your thoughts at various points. Um, uh, we're going to be having some polls uh, and, uh, and some, some questions and answers for you. We're going to be looking at some everyday language examples and then apply them to 
real essay questions. And finally, there'll be an opportunity for you to ask some questions about any aspect of the essay writing process. I'm looking forward to our conversations. Okay, so the first thing I'd like to ask you is a question uh, about which of the following essay problems or pitfalls you think I see most often when I'm marking. Um, in my career so far as an academic, I've marked many hundreds of undergraduate and postgraduate essays, and there are certain problems that I see coming up again and again. So my question for you, and there's going to be a poll opening shortly, is which of the following pitfalls do you think I see most often? Let me tell you a little bit about some of these. So A, the dreaded seesaw. This is when you've got an essay that's got uh, a whole case on the one hand, X, however, on the other hand, not X. Here are all the pros, here are the cons. Here are the pros of single transferable vote systems. Here are the cons of single transferable vote systems. Here are the advantages of social media use. Here are the disadvantages of social media use. Here are the reasons that drones help counter-terrorism efforts. Here are the reasons that drones hinder counter-terrorism efforts. You get the picture. There's a sort of a uh, whole, uh, the, the student goes all in on one side and then has an enormous however, moves over to the other side, and it's got this seesaw effect. So it's not actually clear where the author stands. Uninformative introductions. So now I'm sure you all know that the introductory paragraph of your essay needs to contain uh, some sort of succinct summary of the argument. But some introductory paragraphs merely rewrite the question. So the question is, can animals think? The introductory paragraph might state, well, can animals think? Um, that's the question we're going to ask in this essay. Um, or if the question is, uh, why are courts reticent to protect against pure economic loss? The introductory paragraph might state, I'm going to ask why courts are reticent to protect against pure economic loss. If the question is, does modernization explain declining turnout in Western democracies? The introductory paragraph might state, I'm going to ask whether modernization explains declining turnout in Western democracies. You get the picture. These are uninformative introductions that merely rewrite the question. Unnecessary verbiage. This is where students pad out their essay with sort of general essay writing advice that doesn't really add anything to the argument at hand. First, it's very important to define my terms. Um, I'm gonna have an introductory paragraph and then I'm gonna move on to the middle paragraphs where I'm going to explain my main case. And then at the end, I'm gonna have a conclusion um, uh, to this essay. Um, doesn't really tell you anything further about the argument at hand. Excessive deference to the scholarly literature. Uh, this is where the authors merely describes rather than actually critiques or takes a stance on that scholarly literature. You know, Professor X argues that 16 year olds are mature enough to vote. Professor Y argues that the Visigoths originated in the region of modern day Gdansk. Professor Z argues that psychopaths are a counterexample to motivational internalism. Um, it's good that you know what those professors have all said, but what, the, what we need is a statement of what the author's argument actually is, what the authors, whether the author thinks that those, those arguments are worthwhile or not. And anecdotes rather than evidence. So this is where there is no clear case selection strategy in the essay. So if the question is something like, um, do better weapons win battles? Um, this, the, the author might write, um, well, yeah, sure they do. I mean, look at the Romans, you know, they, they had really great weaponry and they won lots of battles. Uh, or think about the 19th century, you know, gunboat diplomacy, that's another instance where good weapons um, won battles. Uh, or, if, or if the question is, how powerful is the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court? The author might write, very powerful, yeah. I mean, look at um, Earl Warren, he was a very powerful Chief Justice, John Marshall, uh, John Roberts, he's pretty powerful. You see what they're doing? They're cherry picking particular examples that seem to prove the case. Um, but a single example on its own doesn't prove anything. There's no clear strategy for selecting cases in a way that makes a convincing empirical case. So which of those do you think I see most often when I'm marking? I'd like there's a there's a poll that is going to be open shortly and you can vote. Uh, as to which of these pitfalls you think you see most often. Dreaded seesaw, 
uninformative introductions, unnecessary verbiage, excessive deference to the literature and anecdotes rather than evidence. Okay, um, Rosie, I think it might, could you just, could you talk through the poll results for me? Yes, so we have 30% with the dreaded seesaw, 16% have gone for uninformative introductions, 21% mm -hmm. for unnecessary verbiage, 21% again for excessive deference to the literature, and 11% for anecdotes with no evidence. Interesting. So for the uh, benefit of the audience, there's the uh, the summary of our poll results and uh, where people are sitting at the moment. Okay, that's very interesting. We've got quite a wide range of selections here. Um, I, I will, of course, say that I've seen all of these problems in essays at various points. Um, but I would say that what, the, what I see most often is unnecessary verbiage, followed very quickly by the dreaded seesaw. So let me just tell you a little bit more about those before we go on to our main, our main section of the webinar. So unnecessary verbiage, this is where students say, Things like it's important to define the key terms of the question um, or they hedge their bets. They say things like um, apparently it seems to be the case, relatively speaking, from my perspective, in my opinion and so on. Um, none of these pieces of excessive verbiage is in itself fatal for an essay. So it's not going to absolutely destroy your chances if you do include these sorts of things in an essay. But they're a problem. Uh, this sort of thing is a problem because it makes your essay look weak and lacking in confidence and it takes up space that could be used um, to, to, to fill filled up with some much more interesting stuff, some real argument. Now, um, I have a lot of sympathy for people who um, engage in this sort of unnecessary verbiage, pat padding their essay out, because when I was an undergraduate, I also used to pad my essay out with all sorts of wordage like this. I used to go into the thesaurus and I'd look up various different synonyms, words, so in, instead of arguing, I'd be adducing, I'd be postulating. I would um, fill my essays with long-winded quotations that only had tangential sort of relationship with the actual um, essay question at hand. So I have a lot of sympathy, but I think that that was a, a, a symptom of lack of confidence on my part. I felt that I had to dress everything up um, in long sentences when shorter ones would do. And so my advice to my younger self would be, look, don't spend time trying to seem impressive by using long sentences, highfalutin words. Just get on with the argument. Don't allow your key points, your main arguments to be drowned out in unnecessary uh, verbiage. The second most common pitfall I see, and I know that a lot of people thought that this was um, this was one that I saw most often, is this dreaded seesaw. So you've got on the one hand X, however, on the other hand, not X. I think this comes from uh, schoolwork, where sometimes in, at some points people have been asked to draw a line down the middle of the page. You put the pros on one hand, you put the cons on the other. You might have had 10 marks and you have to sort of hit various number of points on either side. Um, but you really don't want that pro-con seesaw effect to play out in your actual essay. You need to make it crystal clear where you stand from the outset. One way you can try and address this seesawing effect in your essay is to eliminate the word however from your essay. You could also eliminate the weasel substitutes like conversely, nevertheless, on the other hand. Another way to try to reduce the chances of engaging in this seesaw effect would be to think just about how you might argue a case in real life. So if you were sitting down with your friend, you would try to persuade your friend um, that Anna rather than Ben was the most effective president of the student union. You know, your friend thinks it's Ben, you think it's Anna. How are you going to persuade your friend? Well, you're not going to do it by simply listing all the ways in which Anna is great. And you're not going to do it by listing all of Anna's positive attributes on one side and all of Ben's on the other. This sort of seesaw between you know, Anna's great at the minute, Ben's great at inspiring people to come and join in with charitable events and so on. Because then it won't be clear precisely where you stand. You're trying to make the case for Anna, not for Ben. The way to do that is to build your case throughout the essay, focusing on your arguments for Anna and responding directly to potential counter arguments 
um, on, uh, for, from those who are Ben partisans. Right, so yeah, I can see why you like Ben, but uh, think about the way in which Anna handled that, bet, uh, that bad press the other year. The ability to handle setbacks like that is a key component of leadership. So you've established your metric, metric of success and you've responded directly to the counter arguments in building your case. Now, in my book, Brilliant Essays, I go in much more detail about various ways in which you can identify and deal with um, various pitfalls in your essay writing process. So how to make your introductions meatier and more informative, how to guide your reader through the argument, how to respond to the literature with respectful confidence and authority, um, and a whole host of other things. But Today, we will focus on a particular technique I use to help people to think skeptically and creatively about essay questions. And that is a technique of examining assumptions. These are the sorts of skills that you have uh, and that you use without thinking about it in everyday speech. Um, often when we're talking, we make various assumptions about the world and um, we can reveal those assumptions um, if we look hard at the words um, and, and, and the vocabulary that, that we're using. So let me give you um, a particular example. Why do you adore semicolons? Are you still in denial? Are apples sweet or sour? You might have a sort of, okay, a little bit of strange questions you're asking me. And that's because they're making various different assumptions that you might want to question. OK, so if I asked you, why do you adore semicolons? You might think, well, OK, uh, hang on. I'm, I'm not sure I do adore semicolons, actually. And I would have every sympathy with you if you don't. And that's because every time you use the word why, why X, why do you adore semicolons? You're assuming that X is indeed the case, that you do adore semicolons. So you wouldn't just immediately riff off a reason why, set of reasons why you adore semicolons. You would want to question that assumption that you in fact do adore semicolons. That might be a pretty contestable assumption. If I were to ask you, are you still in denial? You might think, well, hang on. Um, the use of the word still here is implying some sort of temporal perspective. So words like currently, nowadays, still, um, it implies it's asking you whether you're in denial now, but it's implying and assuming that you used to be in denial in the past. And you might want to question that. Although, funny enough, if you deny uh, that you used to be in denial, you're in a way you're sort of confirming the truth of the of the assumptions. So it's a sort of truth paradox. But leaving that aside, whenever you see this word like still, it's introducing a temporal parameter to your questioning. And if I were to ask you, are apples sweet or sour? That question contains several different assumptions. This little word or, look out for it whenever you see it, because it contains several different assumptions. If I say, are apples sweet or sour? I'm assuming that these two options are mutually exclusive, often, uh, so that you can only have one or the other, but not both. And you might want to question that assumption. There might be some apples which are both sweet and sour, and that's what gives them their special tangy taste. They're both sweet and sour at the same time. And I'm also making an assumption when I use the word or that these two options I've laid on the table collectively exhaust all the possible options that you could have chosen. So you might think, well, hang on. What about Golden Delicious? They're incredibly bland. Um, they're neither sweet nor sour. In fact, they're pretty boring. So there's another option that hasn't been laid on the table, but you might you might want to kick back against that, that assumption of collective exhaustiveness. Let's have a look at a couple more examples before we move on to our essay writing. Do students get bad marks in essays because they're stupid or because they're lazy? OK, I'm hoping many of you went, uh -huh. OK, that's there's there's some serious assumptions here um, that we might want to question. You might think, well, hang on a sec, students could be both stupid and lazy. And those of you who are more charitable might think, well, hang on, students some, could get bad marks for a whole load of reasons, not because they're stupid or lazy. It could be all sorts of things that are going on in their lives that mean that they get bad marks. Um, and it's, it's not because they're stupid or they're lazy at all. So these options are not necessarily mutually exclusive and they're not necessarily collectively exhaustive either. Why do students still pose rhetorical questions in their essays? There's two assumptions here in this question. Uh, 
of course, though the word why, why X implies that X is indeed the, play, the case, that students do pose rhetorical questions in their essays, but the use of the word still is giving us that temporal parameter. So it suggests that at least in some point in the past, students used to pose rhetorical questions in their essays. How does extensive thesaurus usage improve essay quality? Well, just like the use of the word why, whenever you have the word how, or sometimes when or what X, that is assuming that X is indeed the case. So this question is assuming that extensive thesaurus usage does improve essay quality. And as I said beforehand, I don't think that's true. I think that's a very contestable assumption. In fact, I would say, uh, no, extensive thesaurus usage does not improve essay quality. Finally, what is the formula for essay writing success? This is an interesting one. There is a word here that indicates an assumption. I wonder if any of you have been able to identify it. It's the word the, the definite article. So if I say what is the formula for essay writing success, I'm implying that there is a formula for essay writing success and that there's only one of them. And as I said at the very beginning, that's a, that, that, that assumption is false. There is no special single right way to write an essay. There's no special formula for essay writing success. So we'd want to kick back against that assumption. And you can use all of these sorts of techniques to deal with essay questions too. I'm hoping that you found those sort of everyday examples pretty easy um, because the way, as you're using language, you are naturally drawn to thinking about various different assumptions. And so you can apply the same skeptical approach to your essay questions as well. Let's have a look at some of these. Is the third world still a useful concept? Remember the assumption that's underpinned by the use of the word still? It implies that the third world used to be a useful concept. Now, leaving aside the, the fact that in many quarters it's seen as an offensive term today, even when that term was first proposed during the time of the Cold War, you've got a term that's used quite imprecisely, it's quite vague, it's quite loosely defined, and people didn't agree about which countries actually uh, fit into that category. So we'd want to think very carefully here about what we understand by a useful concept in order to question that assumption that's underlying that, that question. Is Macbeth a criminal sociopath or a victim? Um, remember those ex the assumptions of mutual exclusivity and collective exhaustiveness? Well, sociopaths can be victims too, could be a bit of both, and Macbeth could be neither of these. You might have a different interpretation that you'd want to advance. Why is international police cooperation so difficult? Underpinned by the use of the word why is the assumption that international police cooperation is indeed difficult. Well, we might want to question that. What about uh, joint investigations, sharing information, cross-border pursuits, and so on. Um, I'm not saying necessarily that you have to reject the assumption, right? The assumption might be correct. You might decide on reflection that that assumption is indeed uh, true, but it's a very good idea to take it out and look at it critically, because then you're really thinking hard about what the question is asking you to do, and it might suggest an interesting, creative new way to answer that question. The problem with moral relativism is that it denies societal change. Uh, find that word that maybe indicates that there's an assumption here. The use of the definite article, the. The idea that there is a problem, that denial of societal change is indeed a problem with moral relativism, and that there's only one such problem. You might want to question that. You might think, well, no, there are other problems with moral relativism, undermining human rights, maybe people are actually objectivists, and so on. Um, of course, one note of caution here is you're rooting out these assumptions. It can be a really fun exercise to think, okay, what assumptions are my questions making? But you don't want to move so totally off piste that you don't answer the question set. So you wouldn't want to go in here and look at all the various different problems of moral relativism and neglect to think about the denial of societal change, because that's what the question is asking you. Thinking about the assumption can help you to think around that question, can help to contextualize that question, can identify various comparators that you might want to use, but you don't want to uh, uh, go so totally off piece that you miss out on the question itself. Finally, how did Queen Elizabeth I unite the English nation? Um, the use of the word how indicates an assumption that it, Queen Elizabeth I did unite the English nation. Well, you know, okay, so we have a certain degree of 
military unit unity perhaps in the face of external threats we've got the establishment of the church of england but we've also got the question of cultural unification we've got the questions about repression of catholics and um, we're going to have to think very carefully about the core conceptual apparatus in our questions and that is this idea of the unity um, of the English nation and what it means to actually unite the English nation. So whether or not you accept or reject the assumption underlying your essay question is going to depend crucially upon how you deal with that core conceptual apparatus. Now I'm not saying that there's always an assumption underlying an essay question. Some essay questions are really quite straightforward but it's good to be alive to the possibility that there might be some assumptions uh, lurking underneath because it allows you to pick the question apart, think about what the question is really asking you to do um, and to think creatively about that essay question. It can also help you to read with more purpose because you can start this exercise as soon as you receive your essay question and then um, think a bit about what the, 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 those assumptions underlie that essay question and then when you go on to read you can read with those assumptions in mind and you can think okay so what what I'm reading, how does that um, impinge upon my understanding of this essay question? So finally, I'd like to ask you a question before we move on to our Q&A section. Um, and that is, which of the following essay openers you would choose if you were writing um, an essay on a particular question? That question, is this. The problem with the US presidency is that expectations always exceed capacity. Discuss. Now, uh, you may not know anything about American politics, but you can certainly look at this question and see that there is a little assumption hiding behind the use of the word the, that um, this question seems to be implying that higher expectations and lower capacity is uh, a problem with the US capacity and it is the only, perhaps the only problem with the US presidency. Well, question, an assumption that we may or may not want to question. But how would you decide to start this essay? And there's going to be a poll that's opening in just a moment. Let me read through these introductions and just have a think about which one you would choose if you were answering this question. The problem with the presidency is not that capacity is too small, but that expectations have become too great. That's A. B. High expectations are not the main problem for the US presidency, uh, but a valuable democratic safeguard. C. Since World War II, inflated public expectations of presidents have made legislative stasis and presidential failure almost certain. Excessive expectations are not the only difficulties facing the presidency. The main problem is managing his agenda in Congress. Uh, so the poll is going to open for you. And I wonder if you could vote according to which of these essay openers you would choose in response to that question. I'll just give people a moment to read through them again in their own time before I cover the screen with the poll. So when you're ready, please select the essay opener that you would choose um, if you were writing that essay. See, almost three quarters of us have, have voted. Um, it started okay. off quite even. Um, okay. I'll just give people a couple more seconds because a few people are continuing to vote. Okie dokie. And I'll just share the results. So it's a reasonably even split, I think, between the four options. Um, we've got 19% going for option A, 29% mm -hmm. going for option B, 20% going for option C, and 31% going for option D. All right, thank you very much, Rosie. Well, thank you everyone for voting in this poll. I think you, all of you, um, 
might perhaps be thinking, you know, which of these essay openers is the best? Which of these essay openers is the right way to go about responding to this question? And my answer is any of them would be an excellent opener. Any of them could potentially be a brilliant essay. Okay, so there is, I, I, I would, my final um, suggestion for you is to think, have confidence. Don't uh, lose the idea that there is a single right way to respond to any particular question. The main thing is for you independently to make a decision about which direction you're going to go in and, that there are, and, and to know that there are multiple pathways to brilliant work. The key is loosen up think around the question creatively, make your own authoritative decision about which direction you're, you're, you're most interested in going in, and then have that confidence that you are in the driving seat of your own essay. So thanks ever so much, everyone. I'm really looking forward to your questions. Uh, and now I'm gonna hand over uh, to Rosie, who's gonna introduce the next section. Thank you very much, Ursula. Um, hopefully, all of our attendees have uh, have taken some valuable pointers and strategies away. Uh, would you be able to keep the slides up for a moment longer, Ursula? Um, we've got a slide, and Jenny will uh, introduce us to this part of the webinar while I have a look through who we've got on the line at the moment. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so we have a competition for the attendees that are here right now attending the event. Um, there are two attendees that have the chance to win this book by Ursula. Um, Rosie's just trawling through, picking our winners, and she will shout out the names. Um, and the winners, if you could um, send your address details to Rosie, she will post those out to you. How are we doing, Rosie? We are good we have meg styles and alex rees so i will get in touch with you after the event um to sort out your free copy of brilliant essays and hopefully you'll find even more ideas to take forwards um i can see we've got a couple of questions already in the questions box um so i will start putting some to Ursula and if you've got more questions um, then keep them coming and we'll get through as many as we can in the next sort of 20 minutes. Um, so our first question is, oh, I've lost the box, one moment, is how do we avoid excessive deference, deference to the literature? Any thoughts Ursula? Okay, great. That's a good question. I think a lot of people actually chose that as the pitfall that they thought was I, I saw most often in student essays at the beginning. Um, and I do see it quite often. I think um, the key is to, um, when you're reading, be aware always about how you, um, uh, uh, what your, your own view on that particular author is going to be. And draw explicit connections between what you're reading and your own prior assumptions about a topic and connections between what you're reading and what other scholars in the field have also said. So, um, for instance, if you find that uh, Professor X is arguing that 16-year-olds uh, are mature enough to vote, you would want to place that in, con in the, within the context of the scholarly conversation that Professor X is uh, speaking to. Um, and you would want to draw connections between what Professor X says and what Professor Y says, um, who takes a very different view. And you would want to try to adjudicate for your audience that dispute within the scholarly, scholarly literature about whether indeed 16 year olds are mature enough to vote or not, because it's a live, it's a live discussion. It's not something that is set in stone. One person has a view about this and has, has a certain set of arguments um, to back that up. Others have a different view. And you would want to try and adjudicate that by using reasoned evidence, uh, use your, using your reasoning and using your empirical evidence, bringing empirical evidence to bear upon them. One way to think about your reading process is to think about it in Bayesian terms. So you start off with a set of prior beliefs about a topic. Sort of, it could be naive beliefs. You might know very little about a topic, or you might know quite a bit more when you start reading. Then, as you read the various um, uh, 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 
articles, books within your field, you start to update those prior beliefs about what you, what you think is going on. Um, and you decide for yourself whether you think that that particular scholar, what, what those scholars have to say is more or less convincing. Um, and then at the end, you arrive at a set of posterior beliefs where you've made, you've, you have made a judgment yourself about where you stand on this issue in light of what you have read in the scholarly literature. So I think the key is um, uh, you need to know what the literature says, but you need to uh, go about it thinking of yourself as a part of that scholarly conversation. You know, you need to have the confidence to say, I, I have my own views and I have my own um, uh, reasons and I am able to make a reasoned argument and utilise empirical evidence to bring that to bear upon a set of um, propositions that are advanced in the literature, rather than simply saying, well, Professor X says this, Professor Y says that, Professor Z said that, and leave it, leave it at that. Um, you need to insert yourself into the scholarly conversation by drawing those connections between what you used to think and what you think now by reasoned argument as well. Thank you, Ashla. Um, I hope that answers your question, Mohammed. We've got a question from Britta, and I think this is something that a lot of students um, will probably have on their mind. Um, how would you recommend sticking to the plan and outline of your essay and not going off track? Not going off piece. OK, I think the key is going to be uh, writing a really excellent plan in the first place. And there are certain characteristics of a really good essay plan. So what you really um, you don't want your plan to be, uh, it needs to be Goldilocks right. So it needs to be not so detailed that you might have as well have been writing the essay anyway. Um, and it, it needs to be not so elliptical that you can't really um, uh, uh, follow exactly what, what we're going to say. It's sort of just a series of themes rather than a... Um, um, uh, uh, a series of themes rather than a, um, a, 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 a an actual answer to a particular question. So um, I th I'm so sorry. I do apologise. There we go. Um, so I think the key is to have a plan that is somewhere in the middle there that has sufficient information that you can then uh, uh, follow it and, um, uh, and, and um, uh, follow it closely, but not so much information that you find that you're, you're bogged down that you can't see the wood for trees. Now, um, uh, that, in that planning process, you would the way to, to create a plan that is really genuinely useful is to isolate the core propositions that you are going to advance in the essay at the outset, okay? Um, and that means you write it out as a grammatical sentence and um, uh, so instead of just saying, well, I'm, this, you know, my essay is on the theme of um, uh, uh, Freudian philosophy or my, my essay is on the theme of motivational internalism, you're, you're actually advancing a set of propositions about what you're going to argue in that essay. And then the essay itself is the realisation of, those pro of, of, that, of that plan. It's the, it's the realisation of that proposition. And all the way through, it should be crystal clear to the reader um, what your that your, your core argument actually is. Um, I think um, you want to ensure that the writing of the essay doesn't actually involve the um, main, uh, you don't show the working out of your thinking. You do the working out of your thinking before you write the essay. And then the essay is the execution of that plan. What you don't want, I think part of the reason why people go off piste often in the middle of essays is that they're actually um, doing the thinking as they're typing. Um, and um, certainly writing helps you to think, but you really need to do the, that all of that hard work in the planning stage. And then uh, you know exactly where you're gonna go. So you're simply executing it when you come to actually write the essay. Thank you, Ashla. Hopefully lots of tips there. We touched upon introductions, but we didn't actually speak about conclusions um, in the main section of the webinar and Rachel has asked have you got any advice on conclusions and what you look for in them? That's a really good question I, I'd like to write a uh, I'm, I'm hoping to make a video about this very shortly so thank you very much for that question Rachel. Um, I, I think opinions reasonable opinions differ about concluding paragraphs there are some tutors I know who really have strong views of, uh, um, about uh, quite rigid views I would say about th that, a, that a conclusion has to have 
a, a, you know, a recap of the entire argument. Now, I take a slightly different view about this. You don't want to have your concluding paragraph simply identify the question again, because if you don't know what the question is by the end of the essay, that you're really in trouble. You don't want to have a repeat of the question in either the introduction or in the conclusion. My view is that you don't want to have a really long um, statement of what the argument was in your concluding paragraph either, because you've just made your argument. And if, as apropos of the question that we just had, if you've executed your plan well and you've made it really clear to your reader what your argument is in the main body of the essay, it's pretty boring to then simply go back and rehash that all over again in your conclusion. You probably want a sh very, very short, very, very brief statement of your argument. We're talking one, maybe maximum two sentences in your conclusion. But what you really want is to try and open up the field at the end. You want to say, well, what are the implications of my argument? What are the broader implications? It could be for the scholarly literature, so um, apropos our conversation about how to speak to other scholars, you might say, well, what are the implications of what I've argued for how professors X, Y and Z have been understanding this core conceptual apparatus, for instance? Um, it might be about practical policy implications if you're in that sort of field. You know, what are the implications of what I've said for uh, uh, practice? Um, and so you're, 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 you're basically broadening out the conversation. You don't want to introduce a huge number of new empirical uh, examples or anything. You don't want to have everything come in at the nth hour, but you do want to give um, in the reader the sense that um, this is where our, my argument takes me, and this is perhaps the next frontier for people to come who might want to um, uh, be thinking about these questions. Where might we are thinking on this question go next? Just give your reader a little sense of that. I think that's a really sexy way to conclude an essay. Oh, and don't use the word in conclusion. I have a bit of a pet about this it's fine it's fine you can if you like but it seems that you know it's at the end of your essay right we kind of know it's the concluding paragraph because the essay ends I, I think wherever you can cut unnecessary verbiage please do and your tutor will thank you thank you Ursula um, we've got a question from Izzy um, asking if you've got any tips for scientific essays which don't always allow for an argument or a perspective so more of a discuss the evidence or how does process X affect Y and that sort of thing. Absolutely. So I think that in in many scientific disciplines, I'm not a, I'm a social scientist. I should lay my cards on the table. And that's that's the area that I come from. But I think in many science essays, there is a, a slightly more um, prescriptive. There, there may in some uh, in terms of some of the written output be more prescriptive. Uh, approach required, that you might have a certain way of writing up your hypotheses, and then there is a certain order that an essay or a piece of written assignment needs to be in. And of course, if if you are required to write your essay according to particular um, segments and um, to, uh, to write it in a particular order that your tutor has told you about, clearly you need to, you need to, uh, to adhere to those guidelines. I think the key is to think very carefully about the sorts of evidence that you're using and um, uh, why you have chosen to discuss the evidence in the way that you have and why you've made the empirical decisions that you have in uh, uh, um, as you're writing up. So I think your case selection is going to be really crucial here and you need to be able to make defensible decisions about why you have selected the cases that you have, why you have chosen to approach an experiment in a particular way. And you make, they make those explicit to your reader. So don't feel you have to dress everything up in um, uh, lengthy phrases, impressive sounding quotations or anything else, but instead just simply cut to the chase and say to your reader, here's what I did and, and here are the results and here are my expectations and here's how what I found out either confirms or disconfirms what I was expecting. Um, so it's, it's about cutting to the chase and um, but also being absolutely explicit about your case selection. Thank you. We've got quite a few questions um, on the dreaded seesaw, Ursula. And what structure would you recommend to avoid the dreaded seesaw? OK, so I'm really glad that this has struck a chord with everyone because I do see it very often in student essays. I think um, it's not a bad thing if during your planning stage, the early planning stage, you are drawing a line down the page and you've got pros and cons and you're thinking around the question. It's, it's not a bad thing to think about the different sides of a debate, but you really don't want that to feature in the essay 
proper. What you want is for your reader to be crystal clear from the start what your argument is. So the introductory paragraph, you've got it right there. This is my argument in brief um, uh, form. And then the essay, the main body of the essay is, is, is making that case by using reasoning, by using empirical evidence, uh, whatever is uh, su suitable for your discipline. And then the concluding paragraph, as I say, is, is about opening up that um, discussion maybe a little bit and thinking about, okay, what might the implications, the broader implications of my work be? Um, you've got to hold to your line. So you've got to have the confidence to say, you know, no, this is where I stand. You know, um, I disagree with Professor X that 16 year olds are mature enough to vote. I think Professor Y is wrong to argue that the Visigoths originated in the region of modern day Gdansk. I think they originated somewhere else. And I have the evidence that, that, uh, that um, backs up that position. Um, so you make your argument throughout. You don't flip flop between one side or the other. Each part of your essay is all in the service of that particular stance. But that doesn't mean that you ignore the other side. No, you engage with it throughout. You engage with it throughout. So you say, here is my, here is my argument. This is the basis on which I'm making this argument. Here are the um, key sort of uh, uh, reasoning leaps that I'm going to be making. These are the sort of the these, this is the basis on which I'm making this argument. And the, the 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 main counter argument to this would be the following. But here's my response. Here's my response. And so what you're doing is in every single part of your essay is all building this one case. It's not flip flopping. Oh well, maybe it's this, maybe it's that. No, you're 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 taking the strongest of your opponents, and you've got to be really bold about this. You've got to say, okay this is the strongest possible counter argument that I can identify and I'm going to meet it head on. You've got to have a response to it because if you don't have a response to it, why are you taking the position that you do? Um, so I think it's, it's, it's about having that really clear through line where every single part of your essay is making your argument, but you're doing it not only by building your own argument and advancing various reasons and empirical evidence, but also by responding directly um, to counter arguments. Thank you, Ursula. Up to now, we've mostly had questions about, you know, typical essays, I suppose, and the sort that you think, you know, I've got a month or so before the deadline, I've got plenty of time to get started on this. Um, but we've got a question from Helena, um, which is about sort of take home exam essays. Mm. And one where you've got sort of 48 hours or so to do your papers and return them. And she's asking whether you've got any advice on essay planning and time management in that sort of situation where you, you've just not got as much time to read and to and to mm. write. Mm. To immerse yourself. It's a really good question. Of course, I'm sure this will be relevant to a lot of people at the moment because of COVID and, um, and the number of take home exams. People are not doing them in person um, in a sort of an hour, but have 40 hours. It's an interesting amount of time, actually, isn't it? Because it's sort of I think. The fact that it's a take home exam might make you anxious because it seems as if it's if it's um, like a regular assignment, but you just don't have nearly as much time as you uh, would have with a regular essay. Um, I don't think I mean, so, so the first thing to do is to reassure you and to say that tutors will not be expecting you to do exactly the same sort of work as you would do for an essay where you have weeks or even months to actually complete the assignment. So tutors are mindful that you've only got those 48 hours, right, to, 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 um, to complete your take home exam. I think that um, tutors are also really aware that people have a lot of um, different um, uh, demands upon their time and that people need to sleep and eat as well. So you mustn't sort of think of this as this is right, this is, I'm gonna just um, work on this absolutely solidly for that period of time. I think being, um, confident enough to just sit back for a second and spend the time really thinking about the essay question when you come to it and just playing around with it um, rather than leaping straight in and thinking okay I've got, to, I've got to put pen and paper I've got to put pen and paper because I you know I'm under this really really tight time frame I think it rewards you if you're able to just loosen up a little bit it's that's a tall order I recognize because it's quite stressful these things but um uh, just just to have you know to have that confidence of saying well um what are the possible ways of understanding our core conceptual apparatus here? How, what are the different possible dimensions or definitions we might be able to advance these, uh, the, the, the main parts of the question? Does the question make any assumptions that I might want to unpick or that might give me an idea, a sort of creative springboard into this question? And um, that time will, will reward you um, because then you will have a much clearer idea 
once you've had a chance to think around it, of where you might go with your answer. Then the actual writing process is not going to be nearly as um, stressful as it would be if you had just piled straight in without really thinking about what the essay question was asking you to do. I would give, you know, give a fair amount of time, I mean serious time to the essay question. Um, and I would say that you were not expecting exactly the same standards of um, citation and so on as you would have with a regular essay, although of course do defer to whatever rules are in your own university and your own tutors. Um, but I think that as long as you can identify the scholarly literature that's being referred to, um, it's not necessarily going to be the time for lengthy, um, you know, fully pristine formatted bibliographies as you would have with a with a regular essay. You're simply going to be trying to identify for your reader clearly which piece of literature you're referring to as you engage with other scholars. So don't waste your time there. And don't waste your time also feeling like you have to tell your tutor what the question is again, what the, how the essay is going to go in sort of long-winded signposts. Just get onto that question and uh, cut to that chase. And I think um, uh, good luck. I think is the other is the final message on that because I know that a lot of people were facing these take-home exams. Hopefully, lots to to take away um, for those who are doing take home exams at the moment, or or have them coming up in the near future. Um, another question. This is kind of linked to time management, I suppose, and and what we've spoken about with essay plans. Is as a rough guide, if you had a month before an essay deadline, how long should be spent writing the essay plan, and how long writing the actual essay? How long is a piece of string? I mean, I think. Um, the, 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 there are, everyone has a different way of working, you know, and some people work really well at their kitchen table, some people work really well sitting outside, some people like to spend um, ages uh, uh, at the sort of, you know, different stages, you know, whether it's on the editing, whether that's on the on the crafting their concluding paragraph or, I mean, people have different ways of working and I definitely wouldn't want to lay down any prescriptive rules about the ex precise amount of time that you would want to spend doing um, activities X, Y, and Z. It might be you're a quick typer, you know, it might be that you're a quick hand write, hand note um, taker. I think um, focus, the, 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 I mean, if you have a month, I mean, it depends on the other deadlines as well, it depends on what else is on your, in your life. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to lay anything down. I think, I think definitely not having a very prescriptive sense of I need to spend X amount of time doing this, this or that. Um, at the outset, because you just don't know where it's going to take you. I mean, writing a brilliant essay is a creative process. You know, you just don't know um, when inspiration is going to strike necessarily. You don't know um, whether a particular essay question will resonate with you more than another or that might require different sorts of answer. It might be that there's one that's more empirical, there's one that's more theoretical. I think um, it, it, it's just going to depend. And, but I would say to spend as much time as you possibly can on the planning stage, uh, I know I've said this before, but just to, to spend as much time as you can on the planning stage so that then when you come to execute it, you know exactly where you're going. You're not just um, flip-flopping around or sort of searching around for your argument while you're actually writing. You need to know what that is before you start. Thank you, Ashley. We've got a lot of questions, actually, um, <laughs> a lot more than we'll have time for today, I think. Um, but we've got a few. I'm just trying to see if we've got any on a different topic. So we have one from Ashley actually asking, is there a specific way to structure paragraphs or any sort of tips around paragraphing? OK, um, it's a good question. I think, uh, roughly speaking, you've probably heard this before, but paragraphs contain a key idea or a thought, right, or, or an argument. So you've got sort of roughly one major point per paragraph. That's a very rough guide. Um, some essays I read have almost no paragraph, and it's gone for absolutely ever, and, and that's quite painful to the reader. Um, uh, uh, but also other essays have got very, very short paragraphs, and you've just got, got sort of one sentence or two sentences and things, and that also looks a bit choppy. So you want to sort of find, again, your Goldilocks medium of having paragraphs that are uh, moderate in size and you know what the length of a paragraph is because you've seen them written in books and journal articles. I would say you want to aim, as I say, for, for, for roughly one key point per paragraph. Um, and I would say that um, 
again, it's there is no prescriptive rule about precisely how the paragraph is going to go. I mean, you don't want to get get down to brass tacks and say, you know, the first sentence has to be this, the second sentence has to be that, and this is how I have to have to um, I, uh, utilize my uh, uh, bringing my empirical evidence and my reasoning and so on. I mean, I think that it's 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 an organic process because on on some level, because you you need to make sure that your writing flows elegantly through that paragraph. I think if you're finding that there's two key ideas in a paragraph, then you would need to split them up into two paragraphs. One way to find out whether your paragraphing is up to scratch is to try to summarize the one in one grammatical sentence the point of each paragraph. Um, so write it out as a as a proposition, so as a single grammatical sentence. Not this paragraph is on the theme of uh, you know, uh, televisions. This is this paragraph is on the theme of drone warfare. No, no. What's the prop? What 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 actual argument are you making? You're saying drones hinder counterterrorism efforts. That's the sentence, and that's the point of the paragraph. Um, if you can't do that, then you need to reorganise your paragraph in such a way that it it makes it really clear what that key point actually is. Um, another way to try to improve your paragraphing skills is to read your essay aloud, um, I, either to yourself or to a friend or, 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 a, or a tutor or um, anyone else who's willing to listen, because the act of reading it out can often um, uh, help you see whether your writing makes sense and whether each paragraph is really expressing a you know a key thought and that they that they join together well in a in a, in a, in a way that sort of um moves on smoothly so those are my those are my suggestions thank you i think we've got time for one more question and we've actually got a couple of people who've asked about word count and you know what what do you do when you've got a fairly low word count but you've got loads to say on that topic what tips do you have there, Ursula? Okay, tough one, tough one. Um, uh, I, that's often the case for me, I think. Um, and it's quite painful when you have very, very short essay um, uh, essay word counts. So the, the number one thing to do is to ensure that you've cut out every unnecessary piece of wordage. Uh, anything that doesn't contribute directly to your argument has to go. That's painful because when you finish reading for an essay, you know loads of things. You know, you want to tell your reader all about it. You don't necessarily want to be um, uh, having to sort of, you know, cut it and, and edit it. And editing is a very, very, it's a difficult skill. But you have to be completely ruthless. So you just need to have only those things in the essay which absolutely contribute to your argument. One way to try and identify uh, unnecessary verbiage is to just take a look through and see could I transplant? What I've just what that you know that paragraph said into a completely different essay with a different on a different topic with a different question without having to really change many words um, because if you could do that if you're saying things like you know first of all in the introduction I'm going to be identifying the terms of the question and I'm going to be looking at whether there are any assumptions underlying the question and then I'm going to move on to the main body of the essay all that stuff I mean you can chop that because it could be in any essay it's not it's just generic it's not actually helping you to make your case. Um, and again, another way to, to, to be absolutely ruthless is to sort of read it out loud and to think about how your writing flows and whether you could reduce the length of some of your sentences, reduce the number of high flute words or cut whole sections out. Um, I think uh, I sympathise basically with the questioner there because I think we often have lots of things to say and not very long to, to, to say it in. The ability to summarise and to sort of think about your argument as a set of propositions so writing those arguments out at the very beginning as a set of grammatical sentences, uh, I think can be a very helpful way of doing it. Thank you, Ashla. Um, I think we're at three o'clock now. So although we've got lots and lots of questions left, I very much hope that you found today's session useful, that you might go and find um, Ursula on Twitter or on her YouTube channel or her website where you should find some more answers um, to your questions. And I will share the questions that we haven't got through today with Ursula so that, you know, she can hopefully touch upon those in upcoming uh, videos or, or any blogs on her platforms and you'll be able to find the answers. Um, if not right now, um, then very soon. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you to Jenny and Ursula for their time. 
and I hope you all have a good rest of the afternoon and lots of success in your future essays. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, everyone.